awkward pause of silence there when we were trying to figure out what was going on. Um, I'm Deborah Williamson from eMarketer, and um, that is my last slide. So you've, uh, I guess we're done. <laughs> you can all go outside and get drinks now. Um, so I'm speaking about real-time marketing, and the reason I brought my phone out is because just about an hour ago I got an email. Um, Y'all are probably some of your email marketers. You may recognize uh, the idea of real-time marketing via email, but it, the, the subject line is burial insurance, peace of mind. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, I really hope that's not real-time marketing because I'm flying tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, without preamble, what's so hot about real-time marketing? Um, I am an analyst city marketer. I have been working for the past 10 years covering first demographics and then uh, social media, and then for about the past year and a half, real-time marketing. And um, my career has kind of been built um, from the days when I was a business journalist on the idea of um, following something that's new. And some of, it, some, of, some of it quite honestly happened by accident because um, I didn't really know. I just thought it sounded interesting. But um, I ended up at Advertising Age uh, for being one of the first editors uh, of the interactive section there following the very first uh, online ads that Hotwired put out. And I'm dating myself now by telling you that. Uh, I was then with the industry standard in the late 90s in San Francisco, um, one of the founding editors there. I helped write the business plan for that magazine. And if you're old enough to remember that, we were the news magazine of the internet economy. And we went from number one pa magazine in ad pages um, across the United States, bigger even than, than the bridal magazines, to bankrupt the following year. Um, but I was there at the first dot-com boom. And then uh, with eMarketer, I was blessed um, and fortunate to get involved in covering social media marketing um, back in the early days, almost eight years ago now. So now we're on to real-time marketing. And is this, this is one of those areas that I really think um, people kind of give it a short shrift because on the one hand you go, well, everything's real time, right? I mean, search is real time and you know, you turn on the faucet and the faucet, the, the water comes out, that's real time, right? So it's a lot of things to a lot of people, but I think that there's a lot, there's also simultaneously a lot of, of technology and consumer behaviors that are coming together that are making real time a reality. So what, What's so hot about real-time marketing anyway? I mean, you've probably thought this, or maybe someone has asked you that question, and they probably have good reason, because these are just some of the terms that have been used to describe real-time marketing over the past year. <laughs> that last one was Victor Lee of Hasbro. I don't know if you've ever seen him present, but he is like absolutely manic, back and, up, back and forth down the stage, and he just puts things out like this. But I think it reckon, it's part of, it goes through your mind, like, oh my god, what is this thing that I'm dealing with, and why are we paying so much attention to it? You know, we can't decide what to call it. I mean, these are also just some of the terms that people have used, really responsive marketing, marketing in the moment, newsjacking, always on marketing. We don't know how to define it. Uh, the ANA surveyed its clients last fall and asked them how, to how they defined real-time marketing. Most people pick things like um, content marketing or aligning marketing with trending topics, but uh, if you look a little bit further down, I mean, even 40 to 42% of people said things like real-time buying or strategic business decisions, and I'm not really sure exactly what that means, but I, th I think what it means is that there's really no consensus on how to define real-time marketing, but that's not a problem. I think that's an opportunity. I think that's a way for us to kind of move forward and realize that there's a lot of things that are involved in what we think about when we think about real-time marketing. All that said, though, why should you pay attention to it? Like, what, what's going on here in the, in the business environment that makes it so that we should make, pay attention to real-time marketing and invest money in it, invest resources in it? And I think it's because the consumer environment is changing. The world around us is changing. And that's something that I've seen happen over the course of my career with the rise of online advertising and then social media. I mean, every time we go through these different waves, um, we see that things change. And we see marketers str struggling to catch up with where the consumers are going. And I think we're kind of in that spot right now. Um, you're all probably aware of these three developments, but I'm going to recap them anyway. The, these platforms like Facebook, Twitter, um, the, the wristbands that some people are wearing to keep track of everything about their lives, uh, all of these things make it so it's possible for people to share no matter where they are, when they, what they're doing, what, when, when they're doing it, uh, you share it. And, and sometimes when I post about my child on Facebook and she finds out about it, you share sometimes too often. <laughs> 
Uh, mobile. Mobile is obviously ubiquitous. I mean, we all carry lots of devices with us. Some people, three, four, five devices. I've asked people in the past to raise their hands at conferences, and somebody said that they had six devices with them in that room. I hope nobody here does, but <laughs> that, was that was really freaky. Uh, but, you know, on, the, th on the, third, the third side is the technology. There's, I think the technology has improved. Um, we have better than ever analytics that enable us to, that, to take that process that used to be pretty laborious of going from gathering to analyzing to acting on the data that we see um, even more quickly than ever before. And in some cases, we can go from gathering all the way through to acting without that, that analyzing phase that kind of holds you up in the middle. So those three things, I think, combined are what makes real-time marketing um, a reality for us today. You know, our, our devices are another thing. I mean, it's not just the phones and, and tablets. I mean, there's lots of devices that are all connected to, you know, that quote unquote internet of things that I think are also part of this ecosystem. Connected TVs, ambient surfaces, connected cars, uh, social machines, you know, the list kind of goes on and on. And there's, there, there's many different ways that you can think about real time um, as an opportunity. In your car, um, we've, uh, Chevrolet was here. You know, I know that Chevrolet is one of many companies that's working on d delivering information into your dashboard, so you don't have to hold up that phone in front of you and potentially get a ticket like you, know, you might in a lot of states when you're trying to figure out where you're going. And it's not just mapping information, it's actually information about uh, you know, what's, what's landmarks are around you, like um, you're going over the Golden Gate Bridge, and you might see information on your dashboard or even on your, on your windshield um, about that, that's that landmark. Um, you can also potentially see, uh, if, you're, if your car's getting low on gas, uh, you might get information about where the nearest gas station is. Um, or if the car um, senses that you're driving a little bit erratically. Um, my husband's car, by the way, um, puts up a little picture of a coffee cup. Um, <laughs> It's on all the time when I'm driving. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but anyway, instead of seeing that little image, you might actually get um, information saying, hey, you know, there's a Starbucks two miles away. Do you want to take a break? So another way that, something, that we're going to see marketing opportunities in real time um, in, in the environment around us. Consumers, you know, consumers are another thing that's changing. You know, we're, we are starting to be conditioned to expect information to come to us, right? Not to go have to go look for it. Um, one example of that would be, uh, I don't know, um, does anybody here have kids who swim, like, competitively? I, anybody? I'll, I like to talk to you because swim meets are deadly boring, okay? <laughs> um, and nobody raised their hand. But anyway, my kids swim competitively, and one of the hardest most frustrating things about being a parent of a, of a swimmer is waiting for the results to come. You usually typically have to wait until enough events have taken place so that you can go and stand in front of the board and crowd around it and try to find where your daughter's or, or son's name is listed and what their time was and how they did. And it's like, why? Why wait? Well, now there's Meet Mobile. Meet Mobile is an app. You just download it to your phone. It delivers your, your results for, as soon as the race is done. You can see how your son or daughter performed. And it's gotten to the point now where I'm sitting with a group of parents and they're refreshing Meet Mobile like crazy because it's not fast enough. <laughs> they want more information faster. So this is what we're being conditioned to expect. Now, of course, we don't just necessarily want information to come to us. We want our transportation to come to us. Uh, Hailing a cab is something that people do on a regular basis, but they also now use Uber, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. If, you, uh, if you're not familiar with it, basically it's all through your cell phone. You just put in your location, and the car comes to you. So let's just take a moment to recap what, what we know about real-time marketing. We know that it's not easily defined, and that's not a problem. That's actually okay. We also know that it's easier than ever for consumers to, to get information, to get services in real time, but also for we as marketers to reach them in real time. So how, how are marketers responding? So what, what's going on in the landscape? And it's been really interesting. One of the nice things about what I do when I start to look in an area is um, there's not a whole lot of coverage of it. But just in the past few months, a lot of some, some surveys have come out. And one of the things that we do at eMarketers, we look at a lot of the surveys and try to get a lay of the land of what's going on. And 
we've seen several surveys just over the past couple of months, uh, you know, highlighted here. There's uh, the ANA found that 63% of client-side marketers are using real-time marketing, you know, some form of it. Again, remember, lots of different definitions. 71% of marketers surveyed by e-consultancy said they were using real-time marketing, and 76% of ones marketers surveyed by Evergage, uh, which is a technology company, uh, said they were using real-time marketing. So we're seeing a majority of marketers saying that they're actually using real-time marketing in some respect. Now, the problem, though, is, is that a few people are doing it well. A few companies are doing it well. And this is just one example. We've seen lots of probably other examples of real-time marketing, you know, quote, unquote, fails. Um, they're written about pretty regularly. But I wanted to highlight this mainly because um, I don't know what Glade was trying to do here. <laughs> um, I don't mean to pick on Glade, but here's a fictional fragrance inspired by the love, tension, and style of a British favorite means nothing to me, and I don't know if it meant anything to anybody else because it only got one retweet and four favorites. The picture is supposed to be a candle, I think, but it, to me, I, I live in Seattle, and it looks like a shot of espresso, <laughs> which you know, uh, we, just, we just had on the uh, yeah, coffee outside. Then Glade was the subject of this. There's a blog called RTM Sucks. If I'm Glade, I don't want to be that brand. The problem is, though, is that the successes in this area are really hard to predict. Um, hat tricks, there, there, there aren't very many hat tricks. You don't repeat these three times, right? Um, Arby's had one. Uh, you might have seen during the Grammys. Uh, Social media manager from Arby's, Josh Martin, was just you know, sitting basically by himself watching the Grammys, looking for opportunities for when his brand could, in, could interject or could, could participate. He noticed that Pharrell was wearing this crazy hat that looked just a lot like Arby's logo, and he put out this tweet, hey, Pharrell, can we have our hat back? 83,523 retweets and 49,000 favorites. Added to that, Pharrell actually responded and contributed to the conversation. And what ended up happening is that this ended up being one of the most successful real-time marketing efforts ever so far. And way more, by the way, than that Oreo tweet from a couple years ago. You know, there, there's a lot of barriers, I think, to in implementing real-time marketing. And that's not unusual. We've seen that with social media marketing. We've seen that with er earlier days with digital marketing. Uh, things like staffing capabilities, technological barriers, inter internal approval processes, um, these things kind of come up over and over again as issues. So if you're experiencing those problems, as you're thinking about real-time marketing, you're really not alone. Um, but you also need to remember that this, these are things that people um, have experienced before. And they think, I think they still experience with social media marketing. You know, another challenge, I think, with real-time is that there's a lot of definitions about what real-time marketing is and how fast it should be. I mean, if we look at just two, diff two different surveys that came out, um, some marketers think that it means one to two hours, and others might say it means one to two minutes, or even faster if you're in the area of real-time bidding or when, you, when you know, something happens like that. But regardless of how fast we agree or disagree that it is, it's faster than most human beings can work, and that's why there needs to be a technology underpinning for what you do in real time. We've talked about data. You know, data, uh, th that word's come up in so many different sessions already today, and data really is an underpinning for doing real-time marketing successfully because, because it involves the idea of um, combining lots of different data sets. So, in order to do it successfully, you need to combine your data from your social media, from your customer database, your website traffic, um, you know, CRM, um, I've already said that, but there's a lot of different kinds of data that need to come together. And you know, companies are recognizing that. Uh, Lisa Donahue, the CEO of Starcom USA, who spoke at the ANA's Real-Time Marketing Conference last December, told us that the ability to be real-time and agile does start with data. And her agency has made it a practice that, that data is one of the biggest growing practices within the agency. So how do companies organize for real-time marketing? Um, what they're recognizing is that they need to combine these four marketing functions of consumer insights, creative, paid media, and measurement. And you know, chances are in your organization, they're probably working together already, but they need to work together even more seamlessly and even more quickly, I think, to make, to make 
things happen faster. And there's actually one more, I, hope, I don't know if there's any lawyers in here, but I didn't mean to make that, that word legal look like it was a skull and crossbones, I promise. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's take another moment to recap before we move on. Uh, we know that real-time marketing is not easily defined. We know that consumers are easier to reach than ever. And we know that marketers are trying to do real-time marketing, um, but generally not very well because it's a lot harder than it looks to execute. So clearly there's a lot of questions. And I think if I were to recap some of the questions that I've heard over the past year and a half in covering real-time marketing, and maybe these are some of your questions as well, they fall basically into three buckets. How do real-time techniques fit into your marketing plan? How much should you invest in it? And, how, and is the return going to be worth your investment? And the good news is, is the way to answer those questions is measurement. Now, I'm going to pause here and say I'm speaking to a room of people who are very deep into measurement. And um, my role at eMarketer is not to give advice on specific types of measurement technologies or s vendors that you should or shouldn't use. So what, I'm going to, what I'd like to present now is just a, an idea of some um, holistic thoughts about ways to measure, ways to think about measuring what you're doing in real time. Because you know, it, it, the bottom line is, is if you're going to if you have questions about whether it's good or bad or whether it's working for your company or not, you're not going to know until you put a measurement system in place to understand whether it's having an impact. So what we, not too long ago, uh, talked to a lot of marketers, a lot of leading companies about what they were doing in, re in real time, how they were executing, how they were setting up their organizations, and most importantly, how they're measuring what they're doing. And you know, we came away with six guidelines for, for measuring, and I'm keeping, my <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on my watch here because I know we're getting to cocktail hour, so this won't take as long as it sounds. The first thing that we heard from marketers is that social media metrics won't go deep enough to measure your success in real-time marketing. The good news is, is that a lot of marketers are using, they're measuring real-time. 93% um, of companies that use real-time marketing say they're using social media metrics. And there's things like uh, the likes, the followers, the clicks, the, you know, the audience growth. I mean, all things that I'm sure you guys are really, really familiar with. The problem, though, is that these sorts of softer metrics really don't go far enough to show uh, the success of your social media, let alone just the success of what you're doing in real time. And you need to aim for um, harder metrics, uh, things to, you know, towards the bottom of this chart, which I know it's really hard to read, but um, things like um, tying it to product or sales revenue uh, or direct responses or downloads, things like that. Um, I'd like to pause right now and share an example with you of uh, a company called WestJet. Uh, WestJet is an airline. I actually never heard of WestJet until what I, I saw what they did this past December. Um, they did this really great program where uh, they asked people to, uh, as they were waiting for their flight, to talk to Santa and tell them what they wanted for Christmas. And uh, little did they know, but once these people got on their flight, the elves who work for WestJet were going out and acquiring and buying all that merchandise and delivering it down the baggage claim at the other end of their flight. So I just want to show you a quick video that kind of recaps what WestJet's done, and then we'll talk a little bit about how they've measured their success. Uh, this is kind of cool, the Canadian airline WestJet. WestJet, they're the coolest people ever. Uh, they have this new holiday promotion, I think it's great. The perfect lesson on how to do public relations from WestJet. Well, it's absolutely uh, a brilliant video and it's a brilliant idea. Uh, it's my favorite. Check this out. Before flight, WestJet passengers got to video chat with Santa. WestJet is making a big viral splash. WestJet pulled off a Christmas miracle. And so we are sitting, I believe, just before we went on air, uh, at a little over 1.7 million views. WestJet, Canada's preferred airline, wanted to stand out during Christmas by creating a memorable, real-time giving experience to both guests and employees alike. Enter Virtual Santa, a first of its kind, a real-time holiday surprise, and the key to WestJet's Christmas miracle. Using 19 hidden cameras, this emotional real-time giving experience was captured from every angle. On December 8, 2013, WestJet unveiled the WestJet Christmas Miracle real-time giving video on the WestJet YouTube page and amplified reach with a strategic communications plan and promoted posts on Twitter and Facebook. 
The WestJet Christmas Miracle was the number one trending topic globally on the day after launch, and WestJet generated over 1 billion impressions on Twitter in just one month. The WestJet Christmas Miracle video is 2013's most viral ad in Canada. More than 235 countries viewed the video, reaching more than 35 million views. That's more than one view for every person in Canada. The viral Christmas miracle was featured in more than 1,600 media stories, garnering more than 328 million media impressions from around the world. And WestJet saw more than great social and media results. Year over year during the same time period, site traffic was up 100%, bookings were up 77%, and revenue was up 86%. This real-time giving experience warmed the hearts of guests and celebrated the generosity of the season. It boosted the morale of WestJetters across Canada and made the world smile, and maybe even shed a few tears of joy. A WestJetter would say it was more than mere fun. Miracles do happen when we all work as one. So that was pretty cool. And it got a lot of awards. But more than that, I think it got a ton of attention and got awareness for WestJet and made people feel really good about WestJet, which is so important. And it increased their sales. I have to say, though, First of all, there's an entire five or six minute video of the entire of the whole experience that I encourage you to look at on, on Google because on Google or on YouTube because um, that gives you a whole sense of exactly what happened. It's the video that they showed that got like millions and millions of, of views. And there's this one part of this of the video where uh, they they capture different people asking for different things, and there was a guy who asked for socks, and that's what he got. <laughs> And then he looked around him and he noticed that people were getting TVs and trips and things like that. And we're like, how would you like to be the guy who asked for socks? <laughs> um, but you know, some key stats from this. The 35 million YouTube views, um, 1,600 media stories, but they also went ahead and measured this by sales. So they saw an 86% increase in sales versus the same period last year from this effort. So a lot of moving parts, pretty expensive. Um, Thank goodness it didn't break down and, and you know, the, the packages didn't arrive or you know, then it would have been nothing, right? But it all worked together. And I think it was a really great example of, of real-time marketing. And more than that, I think it's also a really great example of real-time marketing just beyond social media. I mean, you, know, you can get kind of into the box that real-time marketing is just sending out tweets or uh, responding to people on, in CRM or something like that. But you know, this takes it to a whole new level. So that was the, the, the first lesson we learned was, you know, social media metrics aren't enough. Look further beyond that. Uh, we also learned from the mar marketers and agencies that we talked to that, that basically having robust measurement systems is also going to be very valuable because uh, real time, you know, in order to move quickly, you can't have measurement systems that break or that don't talk to each other um, or who, that can't handle the amount, the sheer amount of data that comes in when you're doing real time. So. You know, I think a great example of a company that has done real, a lot of interesting things in real-time marketing is Mini. And they've also got a pretty solid measurement infrastructure in place as well that I'll share with you. But this ad that you see here in front of you, you might have rem remembered about a year to a year and a half ago now, uh, there was this scandal in the UK and Europe about horse meat being found in products intended for human consumption. And not only that, it wasn't labeled. And I thought that was the funny part because, like, if you could, if you labeled it, it was okay. <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm not European, so maybe that's that's the that's okay. Anyway, um, a lot of brands got caught up in it. Really negative experience. Mini decided, okay, no, we're going to actually run toward it. We're going to make something out of this. So they put out this ad. It was a print ad that they created in the, in, within a few days, uh, beef with a lot of horses hidden in it. And they placed it across UK newspapers, plus on Facebook, got a ton of traction for it. Just one example of, I think, the, the personality of Mini and how it works really well in the real-time environment. We talked to Lee Nadler, who's the marketing communications manager for the U.S. and many of Mini USA, and you know he, he lays out these brand attributes that I think make it well aligned. They're irreverent, they're risque, they're not offensive, feisty. They have an underdog status, racing heritage, and of course they have that cheeky British humor that they put on display in this ad here. So, how does Mini think about real-time marketing? What are some of the rules of the road that they use when they think about, well, what are we going to do? Um, how are we going to measure this? I think the first thing that they understand is that you know, real-time 
real time isn't just social media, right? I mean, we saw this with the WestJet example as well. It really also takes place during events, and many knows that it has a lot of really loyal owners and fans who like to come together and talk about their cars, and so it does real time marketing at those events as well. It knows that likes and social media are really just the start and that it tries to measure even beyond that. And one of the ways that it does that is by including trackable links in the posts that it puts up in, in social media so that they can track what happens. You know, did they go to the website? Did they sign up for a newsletter? Did they start to take action in some way? Um, but lastly, they also are creating a baseline. You know, as they do more real-time marketing, they're able to measure and compare campaign by campaign and get an understanding of how things compare or one campaign to the next. The tools that they use basically fall into four categories. Uh, listening, sentiment, campaign measurement, and engagement scoring. And the basic gist of what they try to do is looking what they did, what they saw, what they learned, what they hope to learn. They look at it post by post and they give the campaign an overall engagement score. That's the short and sweet summary of probably what's a very hard and intense process. But those are the highlights of how many is handling um, the measurement and keeping their systems robust enough to manage it. Now, you know, another thing that I think um, a lot of marketers get, are getting caught up in in real-time marketing is, is the scale. Um, you know, and honestly, the, the WestJet example is an example of scale, millions of, of YouTube views and things like that. And I think that's fine, but I think that there's also an, an aspect of real-time marketing that you need to keep in mind, which is the idea that you're not just reaching mass quantities of people all doing something at the same time, but you might just want to reach that one person um, at the right time, with the right message, at the right moment. And so the idea of finding ways to measure impact on, on small groups or on individuals is also going to be important. I think, I think, you know, I think Nestle Purina is a really great example of that. Um, they've been using Twitter over the past oh, eight months now to send out individualized responses to people who post about their pets. So like, if you were the person who posted this um, picture of their dog wearing that cone around their head because they had an injury of some sort, um, you know, imagine when Purina notices that and they, they write back and they send them this you know, customized response of a, of a gift basket and a get well card. Um, they've done other things like notice when someone has posted about their pet's birthday. And um, they told me this story where they said that somebody wrote back to them and said, you were the only one who noticed. <laughs> and it was my pet's birthday. None of my friends did, none of my other, nobody else commented on it. You were the only brand that did that. I mean, how, how much brand loyalty does that buy, right, with that one person when you do something like that? So their objective with this was basically to improve their brand uh, reputation and the brand sentiment, not by reaching millions of people or hundreds of people or thousands of people, but one person at a time. And so far they've done this over 35,000 times between June of last year and April of this year. And they've seen some pretty good results. So they're measuring it by brand changing and change in brand sentiments, and, excuse me, change in brand sentiment. And they're using a service called Unmetric. And they've risen from uh, number 269 all the way up to 42 in food and beverage North America um, as a result of this. So when we asked Nestle what they've learned by doing this kind of thing, by, by, by starting to look at impact over scale. Um, Michael Kotick, who's the director of digital and social media, told us basically three pieces of advice. First, he said that you know, letting customers lead can pay dividends. And that's important, letting the customer lead the conversation as opposed to you getting involved first. Um, he, they've learned that their brand metrics can improve by truly con connecting with consumers. And they've also learned, you know, quite frankly, that measuring impact is hard because these scale metrics are pretty easy to come by, right? Uh, you know, you, you, you can count ma mass quantities of people fairly easily, but starting to understand the impact on an individual and what they do and if they share and if they go on to make a purchase is harder. And they don't have all the answers, but they know that, that doing this and engaging in this, in this action is something that's starting to pay dividends for them. So, you know, an, another great example, I think, is the idea that, um, you know, real time, just like any other medium, or real time is not a medium, but real time, just like any other activity that you do, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has to be compared across other metrics and across other disciplines, um, you know, TV, print, search, et cetera, et cetera. And, 
you know, we, we talked to, uh, to Visa for this part of the, of the piece, and um, you know, they gave us basically three pieces of advice on how they approach measuring real-time marketing. And you know, it boils down to measuring things like the, key, the impact on their key business drivers, which for them is their payment volume or their brand performance. You know, as a major you know, consumer marketer, a brand marketer, they, they focus on reach, but they also focus on the quality of engagement. And, they also, and the most important thing that they do, I think, though, is they try to normalize their metrics against other types of marketing tactics so that they can, again, create a baseline, an idea of where things are moving and if we're starting to see impact on actual key business drivers. Uh, I spoke with Shiv Singh, who's the Senior Vice President of Global Brand Transformation, and he, you know, he basically put it on, out on pretty baldly, I think. You know, he says that the reason why real-time marketing is still in, in its infancy is because there's not metrics in place yet to be able to track the scale, the predictability, or the repeatability of it. And you know, he thinks that's something that they're going to crack this year. And I, I'm going to go back and ask him later in the year and see if they were able to do that or not. But um, at least they're trying. And I know there's brands in this room that are also trying to uh, you know, get to the point of understanding the impact of what they're doing in real time on things other than you know, standard basic engagement metrics. I think Visa's Go in Six campaign is a pretty good example of um, what they've been doing in real time. And you know, the objective, um, similar to what Nestle was doing, their objective was to improve brand metrics and engagement. Uh, among these consumers, we're typically used to seeing discounts and, and offers from their credit card companies. And what they did is they worked with their agency, MRY, to create short form video, short form content that's all designed to get people to go out and do something that they love, whether it be shopping or travel. And the way that real time was incorporated into that is that uh, they used real time data and real time insights from uh, what they were doing in social media and other areas to then hone the campaign to create new, new versions of campaigns, different targeting to start and stop their media efforts. And they also used Onmetric to compare their results, and they, ris they rose from number seven all the way up to number one, um, the financial service brand, based on audience strength and engagement, at least according to that ranking. So now, uh, you know, I, I think it's important, you know, what we've talked about so far is, is external measurements, but it's also important, I think, to have internal measurements and internal be benchmarks for how you think about your own performance, whether you're in an agency or whether you're in a marketer environment, and comparing how you've done things in the past and how quickly you're able to do things you know, over time, I think is also going to be important. Some of the things that you can measure are things like how long did it take from developing a concept to uh, producing the creative. Uh, you can also measure how long it takes to go from seeing creative examples to um, the final approval within your business. And then from approval to posting and launching. So those are metrics that you can measure and compare over time. When it comes to content creation, I think those are also metrics that you can measure. Um, we, when we talked to the marketers and agencies that, that we interviewed for our report, they said that things like you can measure on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis the ideas, the number of ideas that were generated, um, how many pieces were developed, and what's the ratio of developed pieces to approved pieces. And again, those are all internal metrics, but also really vitally important to building an overall you know, fluid and agile organization. The last piece of advice, or the last guideline that I wanted to share with you is obviously the biggest one, and everybody wants to focus on it, which is trying to figure out the impact of real-time marketing on sales. And um, you know, we're, we're, that's that's the holy grail for social media and digital, and, and you know, mobile and, and uh, TV. You know, I mean, you can kind of go back and 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 see that measuring the impact on sales is something that everybody's been talking about, and it's true for real time as well. It's also true, though, that I think marketers are a lot less inclined to, to measure um, their real-time marketing or see the value of real-time marketing um, as a sales driver. The Immediate Future, which is a consultancy in the UK, surveyed UK marketers, found, but I think this, this study is pretty indicative of US marketers as well. 76% um, said they valued the increased audience engagement, whereas only 25% uh, valued um, better conversion and ROI. 
And the problem is, though, that these metrics that describe engagement, like we talked about before, these social media metrics, really won't be enough to prove ROI. Um, Capital One, uh, Patrick McLean from Capital One spoke at the ANA's conference, and you know he said basically, impact on brand performance is great, but when, until we get to the point where we can actually measure the real drivers of the economics of the business, we're, we're not really going to see the money flow into real-time marketing. So they need to start seeing the, that sort of measurement to be able to move forward. Like I mentioned, this isn't something, in an area where anybody has all of the answers. Um, if you have some answers, I'd love to hear them, because I think we're in the very early stages. But you know, Lee, Lee Nadler of many told us that you know, one way to get started on getting to this point is to tag your real-time content and then see what happens. Because you know, if somebody ends up going to your website and signing up for a newsletter, or in his case, just starting to configure a car, he says that's a great indicator that someone is interested in actually purchasing the car. Um, Shiv Singh of Visa said that for him it's important to use third-party data providers to track the offline impact of what they're doing in digital environments. And we heard that from, uh, from Blake at Facebook as well. I mean, that's a big reason why Facebook has been more and more successful for brands is because of this third-party data that they're using so that you can start to put all the pieces together to find, you know, follow the trail um, until the sale gets made. Um, and Nestle Purina is kind of a different example because, you know, as you know, if you work for a CPG company, the path to purchase is not very, it's hard to figure out you know, what drove someone to ultimately make a purchase, whether it was that you know, end aisle display that, or whether it was something they saw on Facebook two months ago. And so he recognizes that, uh, but he really fir firmly believes that this personalized approach that they're taking is going to pay dividends over time. So just a final recap, we know real-time marketing isn't easily defined. We know that it's easier than ever for consumers to get information and services and for us to reach them. We know that a lot of people are trying real-time marketing but not very successfully, and we know that social media metrics won't be enough to prove the ROI. So I'd like to leave you with, leave you with like three final questions to think about as you kind of go forward in your real-time marketing and to start to understand, to ask yourself well, what, when you're thinking about where you should go next. I think you should look at how consumers responded beyond those simple engagement re metrics in social, that, you, that you might see in social media. Comparing your results against marketing that's more traditional or took longer to execute is another thing that'll be important. And of course, trying to get to the point of measuring the impact on sales, uh, however you can get to that, is the third component, the third question that you should ask. So the reason you should ask these questions is that so when someone asks you what's so hot about real-time marketing anyway, you'll have an answer. Thank you very much. I wanted to add that uh, this was based on a report that I wrote a couple months ago, and you all are going to get uh, a link to download a complimentary copy of the report. Um, but if you'd like to get it now or sooner, uh, the link is right here on the, on the screen. Uh, if you can't read it, https colon slash slash www.emarketer.com slash go slash iProspect2014. <laughs> So thank you very much. I hope we have a little bit of time for questions. We're five minutes away from uh, ending. So if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to take them. Or you all want drinks. <laughs> or we can talk over drinks. How about that? <laughs> yes. You know, um, I think I spend a lot of time, and this may not be my, a topic for me to cover necessarily, but I think it's a topic that is worth paying attention to. Um, it's the environment of media and how television watching is changing. I don't even call it TV. Video watching is changing. Um, I have a feeling there won't be networks in the future. I think they'll just be programming rights holders that you'll all just be accessing um, information from. I think you'll be able to see any video you want, any time you want it, any place you want it, and start and stop it, no matter where you are. Um, it goes back to being conditioned to expect things and to expect information to be available to you. And you expect it, to, you know, you want it, 
you know, I want to see that movie that, uh, that uh, is a great example, actually. I, the, the movie, The, the Descendants, uh, George Clooney, Hawaii. Um, I watched the movie several years ago, then I read the book a couple weeks ago on spring break. I want to watch the movie again. I can't find it. It's not on Netflix. It's not on Comcast On Demand. I, I'm like, where is it? <laughs> I want to watch this movie. So just to get back to your question, I mean, I think that seeing this on-demand environment evolve is going to be really interesting. And more importantly, I think seeing where marketers fit in into that on-demand environment is going to be really interesting because you're not suddenly talking to a huge audience. You're talking to maybe one person who's watching, you know, Game of Thrones episode three, season two, or whatever at a given moment. And how do you how do you reach them? It's not the same as when you're using mass quantity or mass television. Hi. So um, I'm just going to reference that checklist that you had up um, sort of towards the beginning of the presentation that showed kind of all the steps that like a real time uh, action has to go through. Obviously, like it's going to go through the marketing team and legal has to be there. Um, how do you see brands effectively structuring teams so that they can, you know, jump on these opportunities? Like, do they have to have a legal person sitting there when they're coming up with these ideas? <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we talked to a bunch of brands about that when um, I did a report on how the, the creative process was speeding up. And I think the key to it is to have a guidebook in place from legal before you start. So you know what you can say, you know what you can do, you know, you, you know how you can respond, so that you don't have to necessarily wait for someone, you know, two floors away or two continents away for that matter to get back to you. Because I think you end up be, being, the, you, could create the great, you could create the greatest creative in the world and it could perform awesome, but if you deploy it too late because you're waiting for someone to approve it, then that whole moment is lost. So that's the piece of advice that we heard most often was just have a guidebook, have a playbook set so that you know what to do and you know how to execute when the time comes. And that doesn't save you from, you know, the, the gaffe, like, I think it was US Air. I don't know if you saw this a couple weeks ago. Some, I, I hate, hate even to bring it up, but somebody tweeted out a really bad X-rated picture on the US Air account, to, you know, in response to a CRM request. And so it doesn't completely keep you from making mistakes like that, but it'll go a long way to help, for sure. All right. Well, I'll be around this evening. If, uh, last, last call for questions. I'll be around this evening, cocktails and all, so if anybody has anything else, I'd be happy to chat. Thank you.